Coming up next on the SPNN Forum, I'll be speaking with Derek Scherer, General Manager of the St. Paul Saints. That's next on the St. Paul Forum. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. How did you wind up in Minnesota? Well, I started in baseball 23, 24 years ago. Okay, um, I'm interrupting already. Were sure. you a player? You look like a player. <laughs> I played enough to know that long term, the paycheck was going to come from behind the desk, okay. not on the field. Right. So, so, so you were a smart player. Uh, exactly. S smart enough to know what my limit was. Okay. Um, and it, and it, was, it was somewhere around high school. So. Uh, I, I ended up uh, landing a, a job with the Goldklang Group, who owns several uh, minor league baseball teams, and I started in Fort Myers, Florida. I was there for seven years. I was then moved to Charleston, South Carolina. I was there for four years, and then uh, my, our, our owners, Mike Beck, Marv Goldklang, Bill Murray, uh, gave me an opportunity to move here to St. Paul. And, and in our business, if you have, a t have an opportunity to work for the St. Paul Saints, you take it. It's a great opportunity. So Derek, tell me about the inception of the Saints, starting in, what, 1993? 1993, yes. Miles Wolf uh, was the owner of the Durham Bulls when the movie Bull Durham was produced. So longtime baseball guy, uh, considered a baseball visionary. He had a vision to bring back independent baseball as it existed in the early 1900s. And he identified this area, um, St. Paul, uh, Rochester, uh, Sioux Falls, Fargo, he identified the upper Midwest. There was a league called the Northern League, uh, historic, that, that he wanted to, to rebirth, for lack of a better word. Uh, so he went out seeking six ownership groups to, to, take, to start franchises in six charter markets. And one of those markets was, was St. Paul. Um, one of them was Duluth. And our ownership group had an interest in Duluth. Uh, Marv Goldklang, uh, one, of our, one of our principal owners, uh, flew into St. Paul en route to, to Duluth. And while he was traveling, he, when he landed in the Twin Cities, he wanted to take a look at the St. Paul ballpark just to get a feel for it. Fell in love with the opportunity. Um, I think he also liked the idea that it's a direct flight. He's from New Jersey. Okay. It was a direct flight <laughs> yeah. in. He didn't have to make that trip up to Duluth. Um, Mike, he t spoke to his partners, Bill Murray and Mike Beck, and, and they all fell in love with St. Paul and the history that it has with baseball and, uh, and, and the, the chip that uh, St. Paul seemed to carry on its shoulder really fit with who, uh, who our ownership group is. And uh, they fell in love with it and decided to start here in St. Paul. Now, isn't there a tremendous advantage in being the seat of uh, like 300,000 people versus, say, Thunder Bay or, you know, Rochester? No question. Don't we dominate based on population? It, it, it doesn't hurt. I, from a okay. business standpoint, it's very helpful. Being that there are some disadvantages to being the minor league team in a major league market. Um, but, but I'd say nine out of ten items, it's an advantage. Um, the, the only disadvantage we've seen over the years is, is and this is true of, of any minor league team, you have to fight a little bit more for coverage um, if you're in a major league market than mm -hmm. you do if you're in a minor league market. Uh, the, 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 the major league teams, the, the Vikings, the, the Twins, the Timberwolves, uh, the Wild, they're typically going to be front, front page of the newspaper before we are. Um, but I think that's kind of created a little bit of, of who we are. That's, that's given us a little bit of the edge that we've had over the years. But, but no question, when you're in, you mentioned the 300,000, um, truly we're, we're drawing from the metro area, so it's three million plus. So that's a tremendous advantage when it comes to, uh, to, to operating our business in a market like this. And part of that pressure has forced or at least induced the Saints to be wildly creative, which is something I'm gonna come back to. But first sure. I wanna talk about the, more the business aspect because you know, I'm fascinated with the relationship between ownership of the teams and ownership of the league. And as you were saying, the, the, the Northern League got its inception again in, in 93, or its recreation in, in was it 93, something Correct. like that? Correct. Okay. Um, and, you know, you had to get owners sign up for these smaller cities. And do you go between them by bus? I mean, how do the, how do the players travel? We do. We do. And independent baseball has, has grown um, dramatically since 1993. The, the Northern League was the first of the new independent leagues in, in baseball. Now there are several leagues, but, and, and our league has grown. 
Um, at, the point, at that point in time, we were in what was called the Northern League, which was only six teams within a very near um, radius of, of the Twin Cities. I, I mentioned a couple of them, Duluth, Sioux Falls, um, at the time Roch Rochester, um, Sioux City, Iowa, so all of which very easy to travel by bus. We are still a bus league, but our league now, the American Association is the name of the league currently, mm -hmm. Our league now ranges from as far north as Winnipeg um, in Canada to Laredo in Texas. Right on the so, border. So the, so the league, it's, it's a huge swath of the central um, portion of the United States. So, but, but it's still a bus league. And there are like four teams in the proximal division? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And I bring this up because I looked at the strip, and even though all teams are 0-0, they've got the Saints at the bottom. What is the deal with those guys? <laughs> I, think, I, I think it might be uh, alphabetical okay. order. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that might explain it. I, hopefully we're thinking positive, though. Um, you know, another way we could chew up the entire half hour is just doing the Hollywood backstory of how Bill Murray got involved in this. Sure, sure. Does he, does he know Marv? I mean, how did that come to be? It's, so that he's always had an interest in, uh, in, in baseball. Huge Cubs fan. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty well documented. Um, he was involved with an, a partner of Marv's in another franchise several years ago. Um, he and Mike Veck actually met when Mike was working with his father with the Chicago White Sox. Um, Bill Murray, obviously, mm -hmm. from, from Chicago, came up um, through, through the, the comedy clubs um, in the Chicagoland area. So, so Mike and Bill met through that. Bill and Marv Goldklang met through shared partnerships in, in other in other groups, and then when when Marv and Mike were looking for partners in the in the St. Paul franchise, they reached out to Bill, and and he was on board. And now he's here in corrugated form every game. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we do have uh, corrugated welcome signs for all of our groups that attend. Okay. Um, and you see, it's it's a wonderful social media tactic. If that I don't know if that was our goal or not, but uh, we see more of those pictures posted on on Facebook pages and and Twitter feeds and and uh, Instagram pages. So now, I met him at the old stadium when he threw out the first pitch. And I, it must have been, you know, the mid-90s, something like that. Sure. And I had never approached anyone for an autograph. And I didn't know what to have him sign, so I just had him sign the back of my wallet. And he signed it, and then he just went, Whoo! and he threw it back <laughs> about 15 rows. I had to chase my money down. Um, that's uh, apparently Bill's style, isn't it? No question. <laughs> Bill, first and foremost, is a fan. And he, what we love about having him around is he looks at things from the fans' perspective. Um, so so we, we love to get his feedback. We love to get his perspective. Um, obviously, we love to have him around. Our fans love to see him in the ballpark. And he's great. I, he, he, I can't tell you how many autographs uh, he sat and signed at Saints games over the years. He doesn't hide in an owner's suite. Um, he typically sits in the stands, and as people walk up, he says hello and signs autographs and, and talks baseball. Now, let's talk about some of your more famous promotions over the years. Um, Anthony Weiner comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Now, yeah, we, we did. Uh, he, was, he, was, he became uh, somewhat infamous for, for sharing photos of mm -hmm, himself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he was wearing underwear in most okay. of them and, and maybe some not. Um, but we gave away. Uh, we gave it, he was posting them on Twitter, too. That was, that was, that was the, the unfortunate thing. So, so we gave away. Um, Anthony Weiner boxer shorts. So we, we had a little bit of fun with that. Uh, m most of these I feel like I need to apologize in advance for. <laughs> you know, we, 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 we probably should apologize um, or should have apologized in advance for giving away uh, mini bats on the same night that we invited Tanya Harding to the ballpark to sign autographs. Um, we, we celebrated uh, the 30th anniversary of the television show The Love Boat and we gave away uh, purple and gold boats. Um, it was somewhere around, it, it, you know, coordinated or uncoordinated, it was somewhere around the time that, that the Vikings had a little problem on Lake Minnetonka mm -hmm. in a boat that was known as the Love Boat, but whether those two were related, I'm not sure. Now, how do these ideas percolate out? Is, is, it, is this coming from the board? <laughs> well, number one, we don't have a board. You don't? Uh, no, no, we, we have us. Okay. I, I, guess, I guess Mike, Bill, and, and Marv might be considered mm -hmm. the board. Um, with with Bill being the the team psychiatrist, Mike being the chairman of fun. <laughs> You're in trouble now. And uh, and uh, and Marv being the chairman of the board. But uh, but no, it's it's the, the best ideas uh, develop uh, out of out of just sharing, mm -hmm. sharing, communicating. We have a very open office. The, the best ideas are the ones that by the end of the idea being developed, you don't remember who came up with the original idea. I think one of the more fun promotions we, we've we've had over the years was the bobblefoot promotion. And it happened uh, the, the summer after 
the senator from Idaho was caught in the <laughs> Minneapolis St. Paul Airport tapping his foot under the under the bathroom stall. In one of our promotions meetings, uh, somebody suggested that we celebrate um, National Tap Dance Day, which I think is May 25th. It's in one of those those almanacs that you look through to celebrate days. And as soon as that person said, hey, we ought to celebrate National Tap Dance Day, someone else said, hey, what about the guy in the, at, at the airport? And then it just evolved into the, to ultimately we gave away, it was a urinal um, where you could see the foot and the, and the foot actually bobbled as opposed to <laughs> the head of the bobblehead. So, so yeah, the, the best ideas come from, from, from just brainstorming, sharing ideas, multiple people being involved. And they come uh, at their core from us needing to separate ourselves uh, to, to break through the noise f to some extent. Um, one of the things we definitely want to talk about is the stadium. But before we get there, let's talk about the old stadium. You were there how many years? I was in the old stadium for 11 years. Okay. But the team was there since 93 the until? The team was there t uh, through 2014. 14. So it was 21 seasons there, 21 or 22. 22, yep. Okay. And now... You're starting your third season in the new year one, year two, year two. Which is, okay, yeah. last year was the first year. 2015 was the inaugural okay. season at okay. CHS Field. And what a spectacular design! Yeah, uh, wow. It just it just seems to flow from really intense watching to kind of watching to a field where people are just milling about. And yeah. that's exactly what we'd hoped to have happen. Um, there there were three uh, partners really involved in the design of the ballpark. Um, the Saints the city and the design team. And within that design team, uh, there were the, the Ryan companies um, were, were the lead architect and, and design, design and construction company, um, design and build is, is what you'd call them. Um, Snow Krellick architects uh, were, were what we'd call the, I, they brought the art and the soul to it. Um, and then there was AECOM, which is a ballpark builder. They, they know how to line up seats and they know how to lay the stadia tread and all the, the really technical architectural stuff that I learned just enough about to be dangerous. But, uh, but Julie Snow is with Snow Krellick and uh, w we sat down with her and the folks from Ryan Company early on and said one thing we want to accomplish is we want downtown to be the star of the show, but we want lower town to be the star. So we don't want, we, we didn't want this giant facade of a building to, to to erect itself from the ground and, and stand as this monument to baseball. We wanted the ballpark to be a monument to downtown. Um, and, and Lower Town was already happening before CHS Field ended up there. So we also were really excited about being a part of what Lower Town is. Uh, there were two directions to go. One was, one was an, an open, airy design that allows you to look in and look out um, or to, to, to build a, a brick facade. Um, with punched out windows and, and um, we, we chose the former and uh, the, the, the ballpark I think some call it a prairie design um, that's out of my realm of, of knowledge but <laughs> but what it what it does is is you truly don't know uh, when you've left the farmers market in lower town and entered the ballpark and that's that's the feel we wanted to have happen uh, w when you enter the ballpark you're on the concourse level you walk down to your seats it's a 360 degree concourse you can see the field of play from wherever you are in the ballpark, you can see everything happening from wherever you are. And it really turned into be, it turned into a beautiful theater in the round. Uh, folks sit in their seats for three or four innings, but the rest they're walking around finding, finding different perspectives of the ball game. In case you're just joining us, this is the SPNN Forum. I'm John Forty. With me is Derek Scherer, the general manager of the St. Paul Saints. And we're talking about the new CHS field. It's not that new anymore. It's a year old now. <laughs> um, but the, the walk around aspect, did you spend a lot of time thinking about the, literally the orientation of home plate? We, we had to. Yeah, originally, we, we, we would have loved to see, and there actually was a design in place that had home plate on the south uh, east side of the ballpark, which would have allowed, would allowed everybody in the seats to have a view of downtown. Um, we did a sun study. Uh, which proved that that would have been very dangerous uh, to hitters <laughs> yes. to, to have the sun shining directly in their eyes. We, we'd hoped that maybe it would be shaded from the downtown buildings, but it wasn't enough. So, so after the sun study, we decided there really wasn't a way to, to, to orient it other than the way we did to make it work. And I know there are a lot of ecological features designed into the building that you're very proud of. No question. It's uh, at, at least until the next ballpark is built, it's the greenest ballpark in America. It, you know, someone's going to use our CHS field as a target mm -hmm. um, to try to, to, to reach. But 
a couple of the features, it has a significant solar array uh, over the left field wall uh, that's, that's going to provide us up to 15% uh, of our power in the building, which is exceptional. I think one of the other uh, very noticeable sustainability features um, and outstanding sustainability features is the water reuse ability that it has. Uh, behind our center field wall, under the concourse, we have a 27,000 gallon um, cistern that, that pulls water from the top of the light rail building directly adjacent to the ballpark. And all of the water that it pulls in, we're able to use for field irrigation and toilet flushing. So, um, and, and for cleaning the stadium bowl. So we're, we're able to use a significant amount of reuse, or, or we're able to reuse a significant amount of water. Um, we also are uh, recycling and composting. So I think last year, in, in year one, um, we were able to reach uh, 60 to 65% um, reuse uh, with all of our garbage. And uh, we're, we're, of course, shooting for 100% at some point. Now, who is CHS, and why do those executives have to walk through the out of doors to get to their indoor suites in the sky? <laughs> CHS actually is a wonderful company that, that does so much in the state of Minnesota and across uh, and around the world, quite frankly, but they've just carried a fairly low profile over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a headquarters, uh, an international headquarters based in uh, Invergrove Heights. Um, they employ over uh, 2,000 people there. They have uh, thousands of, uh, they're, they're a combination of, of an agricultural co-op um, and petroleum company. Um, they, uh, they began uh, from, I, I guess they were begat is the best way to describe it, from Cenex mm -hmm. and Harvest States. You're like um, a corporate historian. This is very impressive. <laughs> well, we've learned a lot about okay. our partners. It's a wonderful sure. partnership, so, so we've been thrilled to learn about them as they, about, about us. But, but they entered into this partnership because they, they, they have such an exceptional footprint around the world and do such wonderful business, and, and they're such a wonderful employer. But so many folks in their own backyard didn't know who CHS And agriculture is, is the, really the driver of, of Minnesota's economy. No as question. Much, as much as anything. No question. But I, what I'm referring to in the stadium is literally there's space and then there's a building in the sky. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, to, to us, it's, it's one of the more iconic features about the ballpark is that club and suite level. Um, it, it, it appears as though it's just floating in thin mm -hmm. air above the ballpark. It's actually, it's only attached to the building itself via the, the columns that mm -hmm. come up. And, and that's something very uh, atypical in ballpark architecture. The reason they approached it that way um, was to allow that, that visual uh, the porosity, mm -hmm. yet another mm -hmm. uh, architectural buzzword um, that we learned in the process. But it, it creates a porosity in the building that allows folks standing on the concourse to see out to Lower Town and for folks in Lower Town to see into the building. So um, it, it really is a, a an architectural marvel that they that they were able to pull off. Now, the seats up there. I mean, does CHS own all that? Is, is it VIP? How do I finagle an invite? Sure, sure. So, so we have four suites. One of the first questions that we asked folks who had built ballparks over the last ten or fifteen years was, "What would you do differently?" Um, to an operator, they all said, "Less suites. Mm -hmm. People are looking less for the opportunity to sit." in a suite with their 15 best friends, mm -hmm. and more for the opportunity to have a, a premium experience, but to do it with lots of people in a large congregational area. So we only have four private suites in the area. CHS does have one of those, um, but th that's all, those are on the third base side of the park. Along the third ba first base line, we have a significant, beautiful club area called the Securian Club. Mm -hmm. And the Securian Club seats up to 250 people for ball games. It's all inclusive of food and beverage. It has access to an indoor space and a padded seat outdoor. Um, but CHS also has tickets in that space. But it's also a space that can be utilized year round. So mm -hmm. we've already hosted weddings, uh, bar mitzvahs, chamber meetings, um, corporate functions. So it has a 365 day nature about it, which, which we absolutely love. But through all of that discussion of, of premium seating, um, which we're thrilled to be able to offer at CHS Field, I think the thing we're just as excited to be able to offer is seats for five dollars, seats for six dollars, seats for twelve, fourteen dollars. At Midway Stadium in 2014, our price range was from six dollars to twenty-two dollars um, for for a ticket to a game. At CHS Field, the price range in the Stadium Bowl is from five dollars to twenty-five dollars. So it's something we're very proud of. Um, I was there at the first game and. 
I got to see the mayor. Is he, is he coming out a lot? The mayor loves the ballpark. I mean, he was very involved in, in I, I mean, <laughs> very involved. I mean, certainly mm -hmm. we're very grateful for all of the efforts that the mayor um, made to, to, to make that project become a reality. Um, so, so certainly he's, all of the hard work that he put into getting that ballpark built, um, he's enjoyed uh, uh, several ball games. We'll have him out to throw out the first pitch again um, here in 2016. He did throw out one of the first pitches uh, along with our naming rights partner, CHS, last year. Um, so it's certainly, the, mayor, the mayor's enjoyed ball games, he's enjoyed concerts, and he's enjoyed events in the securing club at the ballpark. So it's certainly something he takes a lot of pride in. Derek, we're probably three quarters of the way through the show, and sure. I would be completely remiss if I didn't talk about your scorching 74-26 and 26 season last year. It, it was incredible. Um, uh, the, the stars aligned for a wonderful season, in, uh, at, at inaugural season at CHS Field. Um, the team played exceptionally well. They, they, they got along great. It was one of those teams, you always hear about chemistry, mm -hmm. and uh, they were guys that, that loved to come to the ballpark every day, and, and they were far more about winning games than they were about getting themselves signed by major league teams. And, and, and independent baseball, and minor league baseball in general, you, you run into that issue at times. Is a player there to play for that team? Um, are they there to, to, be, to win with that team, or are they really there for themselves to, to, for the advancement of their career? And you hope that they're able to, to do all three. And uh, last year was a scenario where we had a lot of guys that really wanted to win, really talented players, and it turned out that uh, four of them ended up being signed by Major League franchises after the season. So, What does that foretell for this year? Uh, you, you know, it, it makes it tougher. Um, when you lose guys, uh, our, our, our MVP catcher from last year, Vinny DeFazio, who led the league in just about every statistic, um, is playing in AAA for the Los Angeles Dodgers this year. So losing a player like that hurts. But, but what it does is it, it opens up opportunities for other guys, and it certainly puts us in a great position to, to recruit. Um, in independent baseball, we have a salary cap, so we, we can't spend any more money on salaries than another team can. Mm -hmm. So e even though we may be drawing 8,000, it's kind of the, uh, the, the, the battle that you always hear about in Major League Baseball, that the Yankees and the Red Sox can sign all the players because they sell out their ball games. R whether we draw 8,000 or 4,000, fortunately it was, it was the former there, but um, w we only have X to spend on players. And uh, uh, so, so what's the difference? What, what makes a guy choose to come play for us and not someone else? The difference is a wonderful facility like CHS Field, uh, the, uh, an area like the Twin Cities, St. Paul, um, and, and the opportunity to, the, the sense that they're going to have a great opportunity to be moved on to a major league franchise. So it helps. Derek, we got about four minutes left. Sure. Who are you excited about amongst the players this year? What, what, the fans come to the stadium, watch this guy. Got some local guys, which we love. Mi Minnesota is a hotbed of baseball, even though it's considered the state of hockey. Um, you can look at the major leagues and, and see that already with guys like Joe Maurer and Hall of Famers like Dave Winfield and, and Paul Molitor. Um, this year we have uh, two pitchers, uh, we have several players we're excited about, but two that stand out, uh, both having major league experience. Um, Mark Hamburger, uh, who pitched at the major league level with the, the Texas Rangers and then was with the Twins over the last couple years, uh, was released by them in the winter and uh, we were fortunate enough to pick him back up. He's a major league pitcher. Mm -hmm. um, he's a guy that can pitch at the major league level, so we're thrilled to have him. Um, Caleb Thielbar actually pitched with us several years ago, a St. Olaf product. Um, also pitched with the twin, Twins at the major league level for a few years um, as a reliever. Uh, unfortunately for him, he, he was released. Um, we're thrilled to get him back, and we hope to have him all year and then provide him with another opportunity to move on. So those are two pitchers we're very excited about. Um, uh, and then we have several uh, players in the field that we're thrilled about as well. Alonzo Harris, uh, uh, an all-star outfielder from last year, one of the best center fielders I've ever seen play, seen play the game. He has power and speed, is back with us. Uh, Willie Argo, another outfielder we're thrilled to have back. So, so there are a lot of players on this roster that we're excited to see back. We've got some new guys that are going to be a lot of fun to watch as I don't, well. I don't know the much baseball jargon, but do you use the word five tool? You've heard of five tool, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We do. And, and when people ask me, how do guys end up playing for the Saints, oftentimes it's because they're missing one of those five tools. Um, five tool players are typically playing at the major league level. And uh, so, so that kind of gives you a sense of just how good the quality of baseball is. 
in, in, in the American Association, and, and I'm biased, but particularly with the Saints. A, a, guy like, uh, a guy like Alonzo Harris, who I mentioned, has exceptional speed. Um, he has significant power. Um, he has a strong throwing arm, um, tremendous range in the outfield. Uh, there, there may be just one thing missing that, that a major league franchise might look at that they'd like to see in game before they, before they sign him. So, so yeah, five tools. We're, we're looking to. We'd love to find that five tool guy. Most of the times, there at the major league level. Now, I don't know that much about really the difference between major league and, and minor league baseball. Sure. But I teach business ethics to MBA students. And one of my favorite examples is anytime you join a new organization, it's important to know the formal rules and the informal rules. And the formal rules of baseball are that players must always obey and defer to the umpire. But the informal rules, what can the catcher say to the umpire? <laughs> and, and the informal rules are anything he wants as long as he doesn't look at him. That's right. You know, is, that, it, is a, it true at the minor league level as well? Should we bring a microphone? It's true all through baseball. And, and I'm glad you said that because this is a huge hot button for me, and we're actually doing a promotion about it this year. Baseball's unwritten rules. I'm tired of them. Baseballs, you, you, you can't. Are we going to write them down? Uh, what, <laughs> we're actually going to give away, I think it's uh, July 5th, um, the July 5th game this season. We're going to give away the unwritten rule book, which is going to be a baseball rule book with a lot of empty pages. <laughs> okay. So it's literally the unwritten rule book. So we're going to talk about them all night long. Y you can't look at the umpire <laughs> if you want to argue balls of trash. Yeah. You might be able to mutter it under your yeah. breath yes. and get away with it. Um, if you hit a a home run, you, you can't walk around, you can't mm -hmm. trot around the bases too slowly or the mm -hmm. next guy coming up to bat is going to take one in the air. I've never understood why the guy next time is the one who gets hurt for the guy who walked, <laughs> who rounded the bases yes. a little bit more slowly. So there are a million baseball unwritten rules. We're going to have a lot of fun with them this season. Derek, we've got about one minute left. Yeah. What should everybody know about the Saints? I think fun, family, affordability. Um, th there are so many things to know, but uh, what we love to do is in what we're going to do this year is we're going to take people out with the fun. Um, throughout the years, our, our, our three simple words that describe who the Saints are, our fun is good. And uh, those three words remain. You come out to the ballpark, you're going to have fun. You're going to be able to afford it. Um, you're going to see great baseball. You're going to laugh. You're going to converse. And, uh, and you're going to walk away with a smile on your face. Um, May 19th is the home opener. We'll play a couple of home exhibition games on the 16th and 17th. But May 19th is the regular season home opener, and uh, we hope to see a lot of folks out at CHS Field this summer. Well, Derek, I will be there. It's really been a pleasure having you here. Terrific. Thanks, Thanks so for much. having me, John. I've been speaking with Derek Scherer, General Manager of the St. Saint Paul Saints. That's all we have time for on this SPNN Forum. We'll talk to you again and see you next week.